It is now uh, my privilege uh, to bring to the stage Thomas Wolfe. Uh, so I guess we've had a lot about lions and dandelions. Now as we get later into the session, it's time for the wolf. Um, Thomas Wolfe is the chief scientist of Hugging Face. And so, you know, if you've been involved in natural language processing over the last few years, you'll probably recognize him as one of the chief architects of the Transformers package, uh, a package that's used as a software tool and you know, over thousands of organizations worldwide. Uh, so one of the most impactful researchers of the last few years. Uh, he had a bit of free time last year, though, so using that, he decided to start a large-scale collaboration with a thousand other researchers to try and uh, recreate uh, GPT-3, uh, one of the largest models uh, that have been developed for NLP. Uh, and so on that note, I'm going to invite uh, Thomas out to talk about challenges in natural language processing research in 2022, large models, multimodality, and data sets. And I do want to make a note that uh, Thomas's talk will have a Q&A session at the end, so you can use the Whova app uh, to ask questions, and we'll be tracking those. And at the end, we will ask them to Thomas. Uh, so if you want your personal question answered, uh, feel free to use the Whova app to ask it. Thank you so much. OK. OK, hi, everyone. Thanks a lot, Antoine. I'm super happy to be here today. Uh, in this talk, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges in natural language processing in 2022, which is current year. Um, it's actually just mostly a walk through the current research direction of Hugging Face, because when we see a challenge, we actually just want to do research in it. So it's a very personal view of what are the challenges, if I may say. Well, it started by what uh, Antoine was referring to, which is our, uh, our strong focus of 2021, which was this project called Big Science. I'll talk to you a lot about Big Science, so, so you know, but basically we were training the largest model we could, which is a 176 billion parameters model on the largest data set that we could create. So um, for us, it was a way to kind of reach the limit of what we could do with uh, a neural network model on text. And then the question is, is what's next when you've trained the largest model possible on the largest data set possible? There's a couple of things. Um, one is you can go behind text. You can go to multimodal data sets, multimodal models. You can tackle vision, speech, video. Another way is to go behind the static, static models. You can have some dynamic model that would be able to evolve after training. Another uh, frontier direction is to go beyond static data. So you can go to interaction in environments um, towards uh, embodied learning. And the overarching kind of background behind all of this is uh, the importance of, oh, sorry. Uh, I mean, all these uh, are very connected somehow. So retrieval models, this model that can evolve, basically could help having better models for uh, multimodality. And if you go to the limits of multimodality, you have vision, speech, uh, video, all in one, you're kind of going toward what we call sometimes embodied learning, which is AI that kind of interacts in the world with humans. Um, but behind all of this, like as a, as a, as a background, there is the, the, the over, over uh, important question, ever important question of data sets. How we build them, how we measure them, what is their importance, and they kind of like uh, keep everything afloat, if I may say. So let's start with a, a quick focus on big science. What is this thing? Um, so big science started basically uh, with the world, with the work of OpenAI, I would say, on scaling low. So, so what, what people discovered is that if you increase the size of data sets, if you increase the size of model, you could have kind of predictable improvements in performance. So there is some kind of low here, basically. Huh? Uh, it's logarithmic uh, scales, which means that you, you tend to plateau if you, if you increase the sizes of the model. Well, here, the, this is not uh, maybe the, the best uh, scale, but this, this plateau behavior can be seen. But still, it's still very interesting to increase the size of model and data set because you see some surprising results appearing. So it's not just, I would say, a quantitative improvement, but there is some kind of qualitatively new behavior appearing at scale. And this is my favorite example, I would say, from, from uh, this very, very large language model, is that you can give them, you can give them like a, a made-up word, like fardoodle. You, you say, hey, uh, language model, a fardoodle uh, means to jump up and down. And you ask them, can you, can you create, generate an example of a usage of this new world? And these models are able to kind of use 
in a zero-shot behavior. They've never seen this well. They can uh, create an example that makes sense. One day I was so far the law means to jump up and down really fast. Uh, and the, and the, um, the black part is what the language model is able to generate as a po possible continuation of this sentence. And you say, uh, one day when I was playing tag with my little sister, she got really excited and started doing file doodles. So this is the kind of behavior we just were not expecting to see, right? Just with a, like, a linear quantitative improvement in performance, we were not expecting to see this new behavior. So this generated a lot of interest, but the main problem, I would say, is still that this model, they are like, super expensive to train. So they typically cost a few millions to train, and you need like a few months on a lot of GPUs. I mean, despite the cost, uh, what you've seen is that there was a lot of companies who started to build uh, some of these models. So, so I just put a couple of them, but today there are like tens or, or twelves of these this type of models in the over 100 billion size, uh, I would say. So Naver, uh, Anthropic is a new startup, another startup is called Cohere, AI21 is another startup. startup. Basically, since it costs just like four to eight millions, it's uh, still quite okay to raise money and pay for one of these training. And so the main commonalities across all of these things is that they are all closed source. All of these models are private, data sets are private, training details are private, it's all like the, the field of privacy, basically. Well, why is this a problem? Well, that's a problem when you want to do research. It's very hard to do research on a private artifact because you have no access to it. You don't have access to the data sets, you don't have access to checkpoints. Uh, usually, academic researchers are just not involved in any of these new models. They, are, they don't participate in creation. The models are usually just English only, Chinese only for, for, for a couple of them. They are made by a team who are really just machine learning teams. There is very rarely any ethics, social science, any people outside of the, I would say, small ML community involved in the creation. Environmentally, it makes no sense to train like thousands of models like this in parallel. Everyone is training the same model, basically. They just don't share it, so it's like a huge duplication of energy. Carbon footprint usually not documented at all. And ethical and societal uh, issues, there's a lot involved in this. There, there's a lot that um, come with this training data set that we've started to see a little bit uh, by investigating the behavior. Typically, the training data set can have like stereotypes, a lot of personal identifying information. So, a lot of this stems from the fact that there is no, like, I would say, social science people involved in creating the data set, right? It's like a very small field. So what could we do? Well, uh, there is an example not so far from here. Uh, we're in Lausanne, right? Uh, if you take, like, 50 kilometers maybe here, you're next to uh, the biggest research tool ever built by humanity, I would say, which is the Large Hadron Collider. Cost, I think, around 10 billion $10 billion, involve a lot of people in the creation, and this is like one of these really essential research tools for particle physics, for instance, today. So that's the example of particle physics. But you see that in many fields in research. You see many of these like world-scale research collaboration. Like the, the, the ITER is another example if you're interested in fusion. The International Space Station is another example of something that was created out of a, a world-scale research collaboration. And the idea is that maybe it's time for something similar in AI. When we start paying like several million dollars for one experiment, for one tool, maybe it's, start to, it's time to get together. So that's what we started to do one year ago as part of Big Science. Gather people, say, hey, uh, let's get together a world-size research community. Let's try to list all the research questions we would like to investigate on these models, all the things we, are, we think are interesting to, to, interesting to understand. And then let's create and share, uh, let's create and share uh, a multilingual corpus that we can use to train the model, the model itself, all the code tools associated to this artifact, and let's try to document all the things that we've done. So, we do, so if people want to reproduce again this kind of collaborative effort in the future, they can. So did it work? Well, pretty well. Here is the status uh, today. Uh, I think actually that's two weeks ago. We are a little bit over 1,000 participants. These are all researchers who kind of fill in the form, sign the code of conduct to join the projects. We have 67 countries involved in the, in the, in the big science project. It's organized around uh, working groups focused on each specific aspect, data governance, model architecture, 
interpretability. There is like 60, almost 60, 60 chairs. So this is just an example of like 20, 20 of these chairs. There are people from everywhere. So uh, Eli Pavlik from, from Brown University, uh, Stefan Bach is, uh, is actually also from Brown, Sebastian Gershman is, is from Google, Danish, this, this, and Enrica from IBM. So people come from all over the place, from industrial, from academy, there's many people from academia here as well. And they just got together to, to build these tools, these artifacts. So usually the next question is where did you get the compute, right? Uh, so the compute is actually uh, provided by, by um, a public entity. So the, the, the French government has a public supercomputer called Jean Zay, which is very powerful. There's like, there was 3,000 GPU when we started the project, uh, and because of the size of the project, they actually added 500 GPU in addition. And what you need to realize is that this kind of public supercomputer exists actually uh, in every country almost, at least a lot of countries. So this is not something special. We just apply to a public grant, basically, and we say, hey, we need five million hours. And they were like, yeah, sounds good. Let's go. <laughs> and then they realized it was a lot, and they say, oh, we need to uh, make the supercomputer a bit bigger. Um, and what have we produced up to now? So the project has been running for a little bit more than one year, which is, which is quite short for such a big project. Huh? We've produced, it's an academia thing, so we've produced a lot of papers already. That was one of the goals, I would say. So already 13 papers published or submit on everything, right? This is like tokenization, how you do tokenization, multilingual tokenization, some work on multitask prompting. A lot of them are, are submitted in there. I'll give you a link later. This is one aspect, maybe a more traditional workshop outcome, I would say. And there is the more like, specific outcome of this project, which are creating this big data set, for instance. So the data set is created. It's 1.5 terabytes multilingual data set. Um, it has a mix of, like, yeah, I would say, more like high resource languages, like English or French, uh, code even, oh, and very low resource languages, like African languages. It's very different than what like, a big industrial team would do. They usually don't really care about African languages, for instance. So, but that's, that's one of the specificity of the project as well. There's a big model, 176 million parameters. Uh, here you have some details. Everything is open now, so just go on the website. You have all the details. You can have the, all the code is open source, everything. And we are currently training the model. This is a little bit how it looks. All, every square here is one GPU that we use. We use a 384 GPU. The model itself takes uh, 48 GPUs, so still a little bit of work to get it to, uh, to be used in, in production, I would say. But that's the next step. Um, and the current training is uh, about 13%. We, we've pretty much like, yeah, a little bit, a little bit less than 15% of the training. We expect the, the end of the training to be at the end of June. If you want to follow more the, the project, there is a website, there is a Twitter account, this is a generic one, and this one is kind of a fun one. It's like um, it's a live report of what's happening during the training. So if you want to follow all the, all the good news and the bad news, oh no, well, a node is broken or something like that, you can follow Big Science LLM. We also tweet the, the current status of, of the training. And what's next? If you want to meet all these people, we have a workshop at ACL if you're into NLP. This is one of the, the main conferences in NLP. It will be in Ireland this year. And everyone will gather and we present uh, 21 papers about the, the project there. So this was big science. And as you can understand, there, there was a lot of focus on data. Uh, basically, what we see is that uh, in the research community, at least, there is a lot of focus on the model. But if you're like in the real world, or if you're actually training this model, you discover that architecture doesn't matter that much, right? Today, architecture and the one we use for this very large training are very simple. They're mostly transformers, very close to the original transformer. But what is key is the data, because this model, they just reflect the data that you gave them, that you gave them. And the real source of most recent progress in NLP and if I may say, almost in AI in general, is this, understand, this, this fact that we understood that we need both large data sets, very diverse and very good quality. So we think that today there, there is a lot of work that, that could be done there. We could uh, understand and measure the, the quality of a data set better. We have a lot of measure metrics on models. 
we should have the same on data set. We should have a lot of measure metrics, and you should not just say, hey, this data set is basically this size. It would be like releasing a model and saying, hey, it's this size. I don't know anything more, but that's just very big. Everybody would be like, that's stupid. You should measure the performance. We should do the same for data set. We should have a lot of metrics that indicates various aspects of the quality of our data set. And this would help you also get better at building data sets, both from performance point of view, what I call here a machine learning point of view, but also from like ethical, responsible AI performance, uh, ethical and responsible, uh, responsible AI aspects, in particular when you want to be able to share this data set in public. So we did a first step last year with what we call the data measurement tool, which is a tool to explore data set that can show you a lot of metrics. But we think this is the direction that we want to continue. When we go um, beyond text, which is the, the second area, I would say, to development, we have studied to explore multimodality. And you might wonder why we should go multimodal. Uh, one thing is that you see that in NLP, we, we're hitting decreasing return when we, when we scale the data set, when we scale the data set on models. Basically, we need to double the size of each of them to get this linear increase. There's also a lot of concepts that are very hard to learn from texts. All the things that are related to the world, but that we can't translate in abstract concepts, like colors, uh, like how you, yeah, how you interact with the world. There is what we call the reporting bias, which means that a lot of things you don't actually write them because they are so obvious. You write about interesting, non-common thing, but we rarely write about the obvious. I won't write that in this big hall there was no window, because everybody knows that usually in conference room you have no window. So how do you know about that? Well, you can have visual input. You can also unlock new application, new behavior. Just like by scaling in text, we saw this interesting new behavior. By scaling in modality, we could have new behavior that, that would emerge. And if we want to go toward maybe embodied AI that interacts in the world with humans, that would be also very interesting to have multimodality as inputs. So this is our current project working. The question is, which modality do you want to use? Uh, right now, we're working on video, uh, image, and sound. And there's a lot of questions around data the availability. Here also, data set, public data set is, is a limiting factor. And we think that maybe a first step would be to make a nice and high quality public data set for like a huge number of modality that could unlock future research from, for many people. There's a lot of questions around the models. If you have a universal computer engine, how do you compute efficiently with video that are very heavy in terms of like size and compute that you need? And there is some question around which kind of architecture do you want? And here also we've been exploring more complex architecture, in particular retrieval models. So if you don't know what a retrieval model is, well, this is a model that can potentially solve of, of some of these questions. So BERT and GPT-3, these are two kind of very standard models in NLP that people can start from when they want to fine tune the model, for instance. And they both have problems in, in the fact that they were trained. BERT was trained in 2018. GPT-3 was trained uh, in 2019. And so they both of them are very like huge blind spots. Uh, for instance, BERT doesn't know that the current president of the US is, is not anymore Donald Trump. GPT-3 has no idea what is COVID-19. So when you want to use them for application, they have this huge like blind spot. So how can you update that? Well, the one idea is to couple your, your model with like a database, basically. And your model will kind of query documents, for instance, Wikipedia, and be able to use that to update its knowledge. So exploring a couple of directions around this current retrieval model doesn't work, don't work well for non-English languages. Um, there is like how you use them in practice to really inject new knowledge, and so more like I would say, uh, efficiency question around do you want which how do you want to use the vector space there? And the last direction that we're exploring is more like simulation environments and, and synthetic data sets. And here the idea is that your model, instead of learning from this static data set, could also maybe learn in, in interaction. Learning interaction with humans, learning interaction with other robots. Uh, simulation environments are like Starting to scale today, we're starting to be able to things on like 
bigger and bigger amount of interaction that kind of show us that just like on static data set, we have this scaling law, which means that they will improve, improve as we scale the amount of interaction we can get. But they're still very difficult to use, share, and investigate today. So um, we think that maybe Hugging Face could help because we like to make this tool very accessible. And here we think that there's a really need to have accessible tools. So this is the last direction that we explore. And uh, just as a last word, um, I just get a book published with, uh, co with my co-authors, Lewis Tenstall, Leandro, who are both living in Bern, so not so far from here as well. Uh, I put 20 of them in the entry on the, on the batch table, so feel free if you're into NLP. In these books, we basically explain how you can do NLP with transformers, all the common tasks of NLP, from classification, summarization, also how you can optimize the model to make them run fast. So uh, I think it's a great book, but obviously I'm a little bit biased. Uh, but don't hesitate to grab them and to ask me if you want to, to have a signature on it. Well, thanks a lot for your attention, and I'll be, I'll be around if you have questions. So thanks a lot, Thomas, uh, for that. I think we actually have a bit of time for Q&A, oh. so you're staying out oh. here with us. Um, a good idea, though, to send everybody packing for your books right before the tough <laughs> questions come in. Um, well, I guess the first question that we had on the Whova app uh, that most people seem to want to know is, you know, where do you get the confidence to go out and train a model this large that requires $4 million? You know, where do you get the confidence and the security to do that? <laughs> it's a strange to say. Um, yeah, that, no, I mean, uh, for me, that's more like a necessity. When, when I see that today all these models are private, that we're going in the direction where research is more and more private, I think this is really not healthy for the research in our field in the long term. So if we don't do that, we're going in a direction where basically academia will be out of research, uh, all these like, private teams will be competing against each other, and that's not the direction we really want, right? You know, all that like, open research. In, in biology, right, you have also this open innovation. I think this is, this is really important, and in our field, we need to fight for that. So, yeah, it's, it was a call. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your answer. I guess seeing as we have uh, a lot of uh, industry partners here today, including many startups, uh, one question that I have for you is, you know, with these large models essentially centralizing AI power, how should many of these companies develop new NLP tools uh, for their own purposes? Should they, you know, run to partner uh, with a mega model company that is making and licensing some of these models? Or, you know, is there still an opportunity to create in-house tools uh, that they themselves can use uh, and develop customized solutions for their own problems? Yeah, I think, I still, I still, I think there's still a lot of opportunity to develop in-house tools, yeah. Uh, either depending on the scale. I mean, for some company, uh, to be honest, $4 million is not a lot. They, they, could, they could afford it if it's an important use case. So you just need the knowledge. And what we are doing here is mostly just open sourcing all this knowledge, uh, sharing all this knowledge so you can do it yourself. Um, but then on the other hand, if you're like a small company, you don't have a lot of uh, human resource for that. Uh, I think there is also, there's also definitely room to, to be a uh, to be helped, and that's, that's what we do as a business at Hugging Face. We have this acceleration program where you can help a lot of companies just bootstrap uh, and join, the, join this. So, yeah, I guess it depends a little bit, but I'm quite confident you can still do a lot of things in house. Yeah. Super. Um, I guess maybe one more question. Uh, what do you view as some of the negative externalities that might uh, come from these models? Uh, obviously, they're very large. We don't necessarily always understand the data uh, that goes into them. Uh, as they get larger, they become more opaque, less interpretable, many of them behind firewalls that we can't really access. Uh, you know, how, as researchers, should we seek to uh, help avoid some of the worst things that can come from them? Yeah. Yeah, I think first, uh, the things that we need we, we should not ignore them, them right? The, the first thing would be just to say, hey, it's too expensive, let's just ignore this direction of research. I think it's a bad thing. We should embrace it and say, hey, let's try to understand where this, well this model really works, where they don't work well. Because they are private, we actually mostly see, to be honest, the cherry-picked example of where they work well. But there's also a lot of places they don't work well. And it's hard to see today because we don't really have a lot of access to them. So I think let's embrace this as a direction that will be here to stay. Uh, let's understand what's the limits, what's the next step, and let's find a way that, that uh, all researchers can participate in this. Yeah. I'm pretty, I'm pretty optimistic that if we can uh, share the thing, if we make it open source, we can make this a source of truth, like a source of trust, 
uh, uh, and something we, we can understand the limitation together instead of just having a, this as something like a bit half scary. Uh, yeah. Excellent. And I guess I lied. One last question. You know, once this model is trained in uh, two or three months, you know, where does big science go from there? Where is this uh, 1,000 <laughs> researcher consortium uh, attack next? Yeah, it's a big question, yeah. So, so one thing is that there will be um, also big science. So for instance, uh, a lot of people, have, uh, like a small group right now is starting to do big science for code, which is a bit the same, but around models that generate code. Uh, but with the same spirit of like open collaboration, open source. Uh, this is started by, by Element AI. I think this is a great follow-up. Um, and then a lot of people would like to train a new one. Uh, I'm always saying, let's, let's first finish the first one before we train the second one. But uh, obviously, uh, when I was talking multimodal, this is an obvious direction where the same thing is happening again. Like a lot of multimodal models are trained, not released, not shared, difficult to investigate. It's not reproducible because everyone's training them on their own data set, not sharing the, the way they train them. So I think we might, be able, we might have to, to come again for multimodal models. But yeah, the, the really the idea of Big Sound was that everybody just need to understand that it's possible to do this glasses collaboration. We don't need to like everyone stay in their small company. You can do large scale collaboration. That works. That's the net benefit for everyone. One plus one is, is better than two, I think, when you work in research. So I hope there will be a lot of uh, future big science. All right, super. Well, thanks so much. I think we're out of time for the Q&A session. A wonderful talk. Thanks. Yet again. Let's thank Thomas one more time.